national nut coming in at number 10 is the animal. It's never a good sign when a mother's dying words are somebody bring me a sword and cut me open to see how this animal came out of me. Also, never good that she's dying because of her son. But when it came to the Leo Song Dynasty, they love two things, killing their own family and killing everyone else's family. So it starts with how this kid, Kian Fei, is a prisoner to his uncle as a child and a bunch of real creepy, uncool grooming stuff happens. So his dad kills his uncle to set Kian Fei free. You think he'd be grateful, but Kian Fei showed his gratitude when he became emperor at the age of 15, and his first move was to make all of his dad's portraits have cartoonishly large noses. Oh, oh, and he did get rid of every law his father had ever made all at once and immediately, so it threw the country into a literal effing purge. While that's going on, Kian proceeds to start picking off family and staff members in an exceedingly violent matter. E.g., the nobleman whose eyes Kian Fei scooped out, put in a jar of honey, and called his pick a little ghost eyes. The servant he killed because she looked like a woman in a dream he died in. He left some of his uncles alive, but put them in cages on display. Healthy, this, this all feels very healthy. Especially when you add in the depraved lust behavior, ordering female relatives to have intercourse in front of him, and then killing those who refuse. So I feel it goes without saying he wasn't on the throne for long. Kian Fei gets smoked relatively quickly, not by family, not by the military, not by nobility. He was killed by a group of his attendants. Just to drive that home, a group of servants killed the emperor and nobody objected. It was just a lot of, okay, yeah, yeah, all right, we can work with that. No, 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 you guys ain't in trouble. Take the day off. So with the entire family pretty much dead, one caged uncle is put on the throne and he probably killed every family member that was left, except for his young nephew, who succeeded him, only to be killed immediately by a general. And then the general began the Qi Dynasty. Now on to number nine for our favorite lunatic and the terrible tantrums. This whole video could have all just been SARS. These rulers were raised under conditions that guaranteed to make anyone a sociopath. Ivan the Terrible's father died when Ivan was only three, and his mother was poisoned when he was eight. During his younger years, corrupt noblemen governed the land and starved, beat, and neglected Ivan and his brother. He, in turn, took his anger out on small animals, which he would throw off of the roofs of palaces. Good practice for that time as a teenager when he pimp walked his ass into the throne room, chokeholded the nobleman leader, and physically threw the man to his trained and hungry hunting dogs. You think that's bad? Psycho behavior, lightning round baby, let's go. So, when Ivan suspected a nobleman wanted the throne, he dressed the man as the king, put him on the throne, and gutted him there. Ivan created a special police force that dog heads hanging from their saddles and could kill anyone at any time in public. Once when Ivan heard a rumor that a town called Novogard was rebellious, he killed every single person in the town and then sewed the town's archbishop up inside a bear skin like this is the end scene of Midsommar and as dogs hunt the archbishop bear men down. It's hard to write all that and then use the phrase conditions deteriorated, but somehow conditions deteriorated. He was known to spend hours banging his face against the stone floor found in front of religious icons. What truly changed history, however, is he goes after his pregnant daughter-in-law. His actions cause her miscarriage, and his son, also named Ivan, berates his father. His father then beats his head in with a scepter, immediately ending the ancient Rurik line of nobility. With the only strong heir to the throne dead, Russia descended into chaos after Ivan's death, and at last, nobles could place a family of their choice on the throne, an heir called Michael Romanov. But before we get to his love life and kiddos, let's learn about how Frisky runs in the family. It's well known that Henry's older brother, the first husband of Henry's first wife, Catherine, died young. But did you know he had two royal sisters who made his life a living hell for fun? Henry's older sister, Margaret, was just as feisty as her brother. She was sent to Scotland to marry that country's king, James IV, at just 13. She did produce an heir after a couple years, the future James V, but her crappy, adulterous playboy spouse didn't live terribly long. So as a single queen, Margaret wanted to keep up her luck lifestyle at her brother Henry's expense, which he did not love. Maggie battled it out with the Scottish nobles over the right to serve as her son's regent, but she fell for and married another Scottish noble, the Earl of Angus. Henry's other sister, Mary, had some equally troublesome marriage issues, at least for Henry. He married her first to the elderly King Louis of France, but that monarch passed away very shortly after. A smart woman who recognized being married to a literal senior could kind of work in her favor, made Henry promise her before her marriage if she was to be widowed, her next husband would be a man of her own choosing. Henry agreed, which hilariously was a bad idea, but only for him, because now a widow, Mary chose to wed a commoner who was Henry's best friend, 
Charles Brandon. The king was furious that Mary would marry against his will since he had no intention of keeping his promise to her and that her second wedding took away the opportunity for him to make alliances using her. But Mary and Brandon told him to suck it and stayed married till her death. Their descendants included the Lady Jane Grey, the infamous Nine Day Queen. And before he went around dismantling religions to get some nookie, Henry was a devout choir boy. You might know Henry as the king who split from Rome and brought around the Anglican faith, but in his youth, Henry was a vehement supporter of Catholicism and its head. He sent tin from Cornwall to adorn the roof of Pope Julius II's new palace. He supported the papacy and in 1521 even published a book length slam poem against the German Protestant reformer Martin Luther. He referred to Luther as a venomous serpent, a pernicious plague, an inferal wolf, an infectious soul, a detestable trumpeter of pride, calumnies, and schism. In recognition of Henry's forceful piety, Pope Leo X, I can't remember that number, awarded him the title of Fidi de Defensier, aka Defender of the Faith. Henry was actually going to join the church himself before his older brother Arthur died and left him a throne and a wife to take care of. Scarcely a decade after being called Defender of Faith, Henry led a schism of his own, cleaving the Church of England into the wider Catholic Church after the Pope Clement refused to annul Henry's 16 year marriage to Catherine. Oh, it's time, y'all, because you may have known he was a womanizer, but did you know Henry was also a consistent king? What do I mean? Have you guys ever paid attention to the names of his wives? So, they were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. So it went Catherine, Anne, Jane, Anne, Catherine, Catherine. I feel like if Henry had lived longer, there would have been another Anne and a Jane that would have come along, and then another Catherine, Catherine. Ironically, Jane Seymour, the middle wife and the only unique name in the bunch, was Henry's favorite. But more on that sappy tale in a bit. There's a common belief that Henry married and discarded his six wives in quick succession, but that's not exactly true. When Henry's older brother died, he inherited a kingdom and a wife, Catherine, and they remained married for nearly 24 years. During that time, Catherine was faithful to Henry, but Henry was sticking it in any lady he could find, except Anne Boylan, who made him wait. So his answer, annul a whole marriage just to get some. But as mentioned, Pope wouldn't do that, so Henry had to start a whole new religion just so he could. Guess he shouldn't have done that, because Henry gets so desperate to end the relationship with Anne, he makes up allegations, maybe history's rocky on that, of adultery and treason, and had the marriage annulled and her beheaded. Jane had served as a lady-in-waiting to both Catherine and Anne, and I kid you not, Anne Anne and Jane had gotten in actual fist fights because of Anne's jealousy. So just picture a 15th century cat fight. On October 12, 1537, Jane gave birth to Edward, their only male heir, and then died from complications due to the birth several weeks later. This is the only woman Henry had actually truly loved, and the loss decimated him for two years. His next wife, another Anne, catfished him with her portrait. Turns out she's ugly, and they amicably divorce after six months, so she lives out her life in comfy luxury in the country. Smart woman. The next Catherine was all young young and hot at the time when Henry was repugnant and unable to walk, and it was more of a classic sugar baby situation. She cheated a bunch and got beheaded. The final Catherine was a grown up mature adult woman, shockingly a widow or two, and of all of Henry's wives, Catherine had the most influence on the court culture, religion, and role of women, and she also persuaded Henry to restore his daughters Mary and Elizabeth to the order of succession. When you marry that many women, however, it's actually easy to see where his heart laid. Years before his death, Henry made plans to build a monumental tomb for himself, but also Jane Seymour. She truly was his favorite queen, the one woman he definitely loved, and the mother of his only surviving male heir. Henry went as far as to confiscate a black marble sarcophagus that was originally intended for the powerful churchman Cardinal Wolsey to be used at the center of their tomb. The monumental tomb was in the works for most of his time on the throne, but during the tumultuous years after his death in 1547, it was never completed. So Henry and Jane were left to rest in peace in what was going to be temporary lodgings in Windsor Castle until said monument was all wrapped up. But it never did and the kingdom was so bankrupt that it didn't really ever come around. So, completing it seemed a little impractical. It had been a long time and Henry's intended tomb is now actually home to another famous figure. Two and a half centuries later, the sarcophagus became part of an ornate national monument, the final resting place of Horatio Nelson, the great British naval hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Anyways, on to his children, because these poor guys were nearly victims of their dad's dirty plan. For the longest time, Henry didn't have a legitimate male heir, so he decided to concoct what had it come to fruition, might have been the grossest marriage ever. Although I feel like the Habsburgs would hear that sentence and as a challenge say, hold my beer. Anyways, Jane may have popped out Henry's only official heir, but he did have an illegitimate son by his mistress. Henry Fitzroy, a surname that literally means son of the king, so a hilarious thing to name your 
bastard child, was named Duke of Richmond. In order to ensure that his country didn't descend into literal war again over lack of male heir, King Henry wanted Fitzroy to be the next monarch. How may you ask? Why marry the boy to his half sister Mary? This plan got so close to fruition that the cup already had the green light from the Pope. Thankfully, Fitzroy was in love and married someone else. When Fitzroy died at age 17, it left the door open for Henry's legitimate kids to take the throne. Thankfully, as mentioned, Jane ensured both daughters as well as the son got their chance. And speaking of Fitzroy's half sister, Bloody Mary, she wasn't the only family member that wasn't all there. Henry the Heck Dick is next. It's widely known that quite a few of these famous noble and aristocratic lines were also plagued by mental illness. Various theories have pointed at Henry's syphilis and brain injuries as possible causes. After all, it would be logical to assume that the damage occurred to the frontal lobes from having a horse buck him off twice. That region of the brain processes impulse control, external cues from other actions, and social and lustuous behavior. He also began to comfort eat around this period. Everyone's heard of that person who's had a stroke and just wasn't the same afterwards. So brain damage likely could be the explanation. In 2020, researchers actually discovered what they believe is the site where Henry received the blow to his head that could have caused traumatic brain injury. But it might come down to hereditary psychiatric problems in the family. His paternal great grandmother Catherine of Valois was the daughter of the famously mentally ill King Charles III. Her family's psychiatric issues seem to have been passed down through generations to multiple British monarchs. In his later years, Henry had a significant personality shift towards paranoia, fits of rage, depression, and anxiety. And he sent crowds of prisoners to the Tower of London. He sent more men and women to their deaths than any other English monarch and estimated 57 to 72,000 people. Yikes. Dictator numbers. But one thing about Henry, no matter how unhealthy homeboy got, he earned that chub. Huge misconception. Henry was only morbidly obese in the last few years of his life. For a long time before that, however, he was one of the most handsome and hella fit men of his era. Dude was well over six foot and had a 34 inch waist. In 1536, Henry was taking part in a tournament when he fell off his horse and the horse fell on him, leaving the king unconscious for several hours and forever altering his cheerful outgoing personality. This is the second horse related mass head injury Henry sustained. After this injury and the further ulcer development in his legs, Henry was left pretty much unable to exercise. His made to measure suits of armor chart the king's expansion with his final set around 1540, suggesting he weighed more than 300 pounds within a waist of 54 inches. As a matter of fact, Henry was so overweight he needed a mechanical device to help him get in and out of bed. When he died in 1547, he weighed nearly 400 pounds with a 60 inch waist. Impressive in a time before 10 cheeseburgers for $10, but I mean if you're over 50, ruled a kingdom, injured his health around 30 years, you can just let go, who cares. And last, but never the least, Henry was a hypochondriac king. Henry was obsessed with sickness and disease, specifically the sweating sickness and the plague. This is pretty fair, by the age 30 he'd already caught smallpox and malaria a couple times. Anytime there was an outbreak of anything, he would minimize his risk of infection by straight up leaving London and limiting the number of ambassadors he saw. Even when Anne Boleyn caught the sweating sickness in 1528, Henry said peace and stayed far away until she got better. Henry, bad husband. Good infection minimizer though. Naturally like any germaphobe, Henry was doing the most to feel clean. So he was known to self medicate. He even wrote his own prescription book which detailed how to treat ulcers and reduce inflammation. He diagnosed himself with so many illnesses and disorders that it was actually hard to keep track of all of them. From migraines to insomnia and gout, Henry's life was spent dealing with and or avoiding various different diseases and ailments. Despite his many tyrannical qualities, Henry wasn't all that bad. He actually improved English medicine due to his outlandish paranoias, bringing the country further into the renaissance. As the founder of the Royal College of Physicians, the king also passed seven different laws to control the practice of medicine. In 1540, Henry pushed through one of the earliest laws to regulate drugs. Apothecary wares had to be checked to make sure no one was defrauding honest customers. His reign also contributed to the increase of supervision of sewers thanks to his chancellor and future victim Sir Thomas More, who drastically improved the quality of London's public water supply. We're going to start with the classic, Who's My Mummy? Around the year 1341 BC, a royal child is born by the name of Tut Mahatan, the living image of Aten. Sometime after dad's death, Tut rebrands to Tut Mahan. This is because his dad is the legendary dumb Akmahatan, who tries to force monotheism. Anyways, some scholars believe that Tut's mom was Ak's principal wife, Nefertiti, but others believe his mother was the secondary wife named Kia. But with either theory, we run into the issue that it's not entirely certain that Ak was even Tut's father, getting cheated on by both wives. That's when you know you're doing something wrong. It's quite possible that Tut's father was the pharaoh Sman Akhara. While DNA tests of several, while DNA tests of several mummies found in the Valley of Kings seem to indicate that 
that Tut's father and mother are buried not far. Egyptologist Marianne Eaton Cross also points out that whereas these mummies are very clearly close relatives of Tut, it's actually difficult to establish precise familiar relationships using only DNA. Egyptian royal families like to preserve the bloodlines, so his mom could also biologically be his sister and cousin, and all of that would show up as an indecipherable mix that does nothing to confirm more than just a relation. If it is Nefertiti, the question remains where's my mummy? In more recent years, speculation about King Tut's tomb is that Queen Nefertiti, whose tomb and sarcophagus are long lost to us, is buried somewhere within. This claim is made by Egyptologist Nicholas Reeve, who realized that the cartouches depicting Tut had been buried by his pharaonic successor I, had been painted over cartouches of Tut burying Nefertiti. Reeve said close inspection of I's cartouches reveal clear underlying traces of an earlier name, that of Tut. In its original version, this scene had shown Tut performing the funerary rite over the tomb's original owner, his immediate predecessor, Nefertiti. The new evidence, specifically the north and east walls of the treasury being man-made structure whilst everything else is cut stone, does support the theory that Tut's tomb is only an outer section of a much larger tomb prepared for and still occupied by Nefertiti, whose own independent sequence of funerary chambers lies beyond. It would also add context as to why the king had such a small, oddly shaped burial chamber. Okay, it's lady time! Number 8 is Religious Mania Maria. Maria of Portugal, unlike pretty much everyone else on this list, had an idyllic childhood. Her father, the king of Portugal, paid a massive amount of attention to both her and her sisters. But while the king was winning dad of the year, his minister, the Marquis of Pombal, managed the country. Which apparently meant imprisoning everyone who questioned him and killing anyone left over. I'll give him credit for still being loyal to the king, however, when someone tried to smoke said king, the Marquis rounded up his strongest political enemies, tormented them into confessions, broke their bones on a scaffold, and then burned the scaffold down. Unfortunately, that genetic religious mania starts kicking her ass pretty hard once Maria is in her early 20s. Naturally, this is also when she ascended to the throne, and the horrific actions of the Marquise in the name of her father convince Maria that he is in hell for being a bad king and she would join him. To alleviate her guilt, she amnestied all the political prisoners and gave them positions in her court. Super sweet gesture, but spending decades in an 18th century Portugal's palace prison does not do much for the mind. So, most of these counselors and courtiers were absolutely insane. When within the space of a year, her eldest son her only living daughter and her two closest ministers all died, Maria completely fell apart. Some days she would embrace the fact that she's already damned, talking in a unchaste manner. Some days she would pace the hall screaming. Her 26 year old second son is made regent, but he was dead useless with no ability to reform an entire court of lunatics. Naturally, this meant the country was in no shape to meet Napoleon in 1807, so when he marched on him, the entire family fled to Brazil and Portugal became Napoleon's. Number seven is how one man changed the line of succession for the psychologist wife. Peter the Great was, in many ways, a wonderful sovereign. Passionately committed to both his country and his own education, he spent much of his imprisoned childhood learning army tactics and designing ships. As an adult, he toured Europe, learning about the latest advances in science so that he could bring them back to Russia. Peter the Great was pretty great. But like many with great intellect, he'd take it and his impatience with those who didn't understand it a little too far. When he was learning dentistry, he would practice on nobles without their consent. When a group of attendants were upset while watching the dissection of a corpse, he ordered them to walk up to the corpse and take a bite out of it. His childhood traumas also made him fanatical about loyalty because Peter was the child of the former Tsar's second wife and had to watch the relatives of the first wife throw his family off a roof. Peter became so serious about this loyalty he had his own son tormented to death for temporarily fleeing to Sweden. One person he trusted though was his wife Catherine. Catherine was a Cinderella story that emerged from a horror movie. Eventually she met the Tsar who became enthralled with her and Peter had fits of terror due to seeing his family being tossed off the roof as a kid, and during those fits, Catherine was the only one who could soothe him. So with his love of loyalty and pride and family, Peter decreed that the Tsar should be able to name his own successor. And that's exactly what Catherine was when Peter died. For number 6 is two for one, a king and a queen, let's call it the creation of Catherine. Hilariously, this couple's names were also Peter and Catherine, but unlike the previous set, who loved each other, these two were flighty nightmares. Peter was a bit delayed, with no parental contact and a crap upbringing, the dude developed into a creepy blend of child and sociopath. He didn't consummate the marriage to Catherine literally ever. This poor girl gets shipped from Germany to play toy soldiers in bed with him for nine years. He also tormented animals in training a pack of hunting dogs by beating them and conducting military trials and hangings for the rats he found eating his toys. This guy's brain was so pea-sized that knowing the king 
king liked watching fire, a minister set his own house alight to keep the king distracted while Catherine was giving birth to their definitely illegitimate child. While most crazy tsars kept their throne for illogically long, Peter got deposed pretty damn fast. Why? He was crazy like a Prussian, not like a Russian. He was meant to be the Swedish heir and he was raised to dislike Russia. Smoking Peter meant it was time for a lady leader and Catherine, who was actually born in Prussia, had spent the first few years of her marriage vigorously Russianizing herself and cultivating the Russian army, who preferred a Prussian that had decided she was Russian to a Russian that decided he was Prussian. Number 5, we finally leave Russia onto France who signed up for centuries. Centuries of what? BS, you're in for a ride. So, Charles IV was the king for effing ever. During that time, a united, prosperous, and powerful country fell into civil war and chaos. Charles began having spells not too long after his brother thought it would be funny to light all the king's friends on fire while they were dressed as wild men, which for some reason incorporated tar. Charles became convinced he was made of glass and would shatter if he moved too quickly, so he would hardly move for hours on end. He became incoherent and paranoid. During these spells, Louis, his brother, became the de facto king. This made him a formidable opponent. Anyone who would make a move to weaken the Count of Valois would find a month or so later they were the enemy of the acting king of France. One night, John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, decided to put an end to Looney Lewis. He hired a group of conspirators to hack him to death in the street, which they did, but while still wearing their work uniforms like it's goddamn amateur hour. So it's not long before people found out exactly who killed Lewis and the nation falls into civil war. John the Fearless went to the English for military support, which they happily gave him in exchange for land in France. Charles the Mad had to declare a, an English king the heir of France to help end the drama, but the treaty doesn't hold because of turmoil in English court, and it gives England and France an excuse to go to war for what? The next hundred years? Number four is our girl, the last empress of China. A little luck gets her journey started. As a low-ranking concubine to the emperor, she gave birth to the emperor Xiang Fang's only son in 1856, a feat his wife, the empress, couldn't have accomplished. The emperor immediately raised her status, gave her a privileged life, and made her son, Emperor Tongzi, the heir. After Xiang Fang died when her son was just six, the new emperor Sichi orchestrated a coup grabbing the power from a council of elders. Once Tongzi ascended, Sichi became became a empress dowager and a unusually powerful joy ruler. After Tongzi died very suddenly without an heir, Siji had a backup ready and installed her four-year-old nephew. This consolidated her power yet again and she served as the de facto leader of the vast Qing empire in, from 1861 until she died in 1908. During her reign, she stomped out rebellions, civil wars, and supported the self-strengthening movement, a period of institutionalization, economic, and military reforms which helped transform China from an aged society into a more modern modern superpower on a global scale. Now over to the Ottomans for number three, which will be coming out of the cage be doing not so fine. Our tale begins with a group of brothers, the most prominent among them being Ahmed the first and Mustafa. Ahmed puts his brother Mustafa in the cage, a tower with no windows, a brick wall built over the door and no human contact. Don't be scared guys, this is what all Ottoman empires did with their siblings. They also disfigured their faces sometimes, pick your poison. So Ahmed craps out a few cents, then drops at the age of 28. So out of the cage Mustafa came, 14 years after being put into basically an above ground pit. What could go wrong? Well you can argue it's kinda odd, he walked around with two naked servant girls at all times, but the real problem was he had a habit of giving important positions to random people he met in life. Without a strong organized central government, the empire started to crumble. Back in the cage you go, but with two women this time. He was replaced by Ahmed's oldest son, Osman. The young man might have made a decent ruler, but he banned drinking and smoking and intercourse in the army. Do I need to explain the problem? Anyways, they sentenced him to death via the boy crusher, which you can learn about in my video of the top 10 brutal punishments from the Ottoman Empire. Out of the cage came Mustafa again, and at this point he had a habit of sitting and giggling to himself. In between giggle fits, he'd go out around looking for his dead nephew, forgetting the man was dead, and when he was told he had other ones, he'd kill them. He also went back to his old tricks, appointing random people to important positions, and the officials in the provinces were one step away from declaring themselves local king. Put a cap on thing, the Safavid Persian Empire attacked and grabbed what's now Iraq. Back into the cage, Mustafa went. Still in the Ottoman Empire, number two is bankruptcy and a two decade war. Someone had to succeed the cage man, and that was what Murad IV did, one of the nephews that Mustafa hadn't killed. Maybe because the dude was ruthless. His last act before dying was ordering the death of his last surviving brother. He had nothing against Ibrahim, but he needed, he simply believed that their line was cursed by madness and needed to be annihilated. 
annihilated. Sadly for 279 women, as you'll learn, Ibrahim's mother successfully pleads for his life. Ibrahim spends his entire life in the cage with only occasional contact with people. He came out with what can be tactically described as a lust for life. Made frantic by years of deprivation, he acquired everything like an animal, including 280 concubines in a haram. One day, he saw a cow's hoo-ha and had a cast made of it and circulated it through the empire for a woman that matched. When he found her, she became his favorite concubine and he named her Sugar Lump. Sugar didn't care for competition, so she told the psychotically jealous Ibrahim that one of the other women in the harem was unfaithful, but only she didn't know which one. Ibrahim's answer was having all 280 tied up in sacks and thrown into the Bosphorus River. Only one survived when her sack came undone and she was taking aboard a French freighter bound for Paris. What finally did Ibrahim in was fanatically acquiring all the golden jewels he could, pulling from temples and threatening ministers. Then Ibrahim started a war with Venice. He soon couldn't pay the Janissaries and they sent him back to the cage. The war with Venice outlasted him by 22 years. And last but never least, number one is the Bumper Car King, aka the story of how Justin II lost half of Italy while playing bumper cars. Yeah, real story. Evidently, he joins pretty much every monarch on this list as having their formative years isolated and terrified of sudden violent death. Doesn't help being a Biazetine heir and having your parents be the notorious couple Justinian and Theodora. Eventually, all their heirs run out except for Justin. Justin, who inherits a pretty crappy situation, seeing as his dad's foreign policy was to expand military as far as he could and then pay his new neighbors not to attack him. And shocker, tribute costs a lot. Unfortunately, the empire was going through some tough financial times and Justinian had been borrowing to cover his an annual payment. Justin believed he could do better by just refusing to pay the Persians while pitting the tribes in the north against each other. It was then under the strain of multiple nearing armies that Justin had a nervous breakdown. Ministers would be asking him what to do and he'd claim to hear voices and then climb under his bed to escape them. On bad days he would violently grab at people, biting them on the arms or the face. Legend has it that he literally ate a couple servants. In desperation and self-preservation, the servants tried to think of a couple ways to keep the emperor distracted from eating them, so they came up with the throne on wheels. Servants raced him around the halls of the palace on the throne, trying to keep him amused with the speed. When he had guests, they'd also get to experience zooming around on wheeled seats, aka bumper cars. In the end, Justinian II fared pretty well perhaps better than he deserved considering his last words as emperor were complaints about his servants. But kicking off the list at number 10, must love licorice. Okay, we'll start off a little tame. Napoleon Bonaparte, the famous French emperor, the famous military leader from the 1800s. Napoleon Bonaparte was responsible for conquering a large part of Europe. Bet you didn't know he was obsessed with licorice though. Way too much. He would eat this all day, every day. Ugh, it feels gross. Look, as somebody who can't stand licorice, I already feel bad for Josephine. Licorice breath at any time of the day coming your way? No, no thank you. I'll hard pass. Napoleon carried licorice around with him at all times. This guy ate so much of it, his teeth became stained. They turned black. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it's black licorice too. Not the strawberry pull and peels, those are great. I'm talking about 1800s black licorice. It would come in lozenges. If somebody offered me a lozenge and it was black licorice, I'd call the police. Smack it out of their hands. Number nine, George IV. When it was time for King George III to pass on the crown, of course, next in line, heir to the throne, is his eldest son, also named George. What if you became king in 1820? Would you be noble? Would you do monologues in the sunset as you enriched your homeland? Kings like to do that a lot with their off oh, by the hair still. Or would you do what King George IV did and make horrible financial decisions every single day? The guy would just party all day as well. He would gamble every day, he would buy expensive stuff that he did not need, and on top of that, he would never do any of his royal duties. Guy wouldn't do his job. His father had to step in, classic. He figured the only way to settle all these new debts set in motion by George IV, in order to clear those up, George now has to marry his cousin, Caroline of Brunswick. The arranged marriage happened on April 8th, 1795, and what was supposed to be a happy day for all was a nightmare for all included. They hated each other as soon as they met. I mean, obviously, he was a fool. George got heavily intoxicated for the wedding. He was just hammered the entire time. And then nine months later, almost to the day, they had a child. And then right after that happened, they went their separate ways. So yeah, horribly unhealthy relationship. Once George became king in 1820, he then tried to divorce her. Like, what a fool, just let it go. Let it all go, let her go. Number eight, 
one too many. Sometimes when you're king, you're gonna have more than one wife that's six feet under. It's just how it goes sometimes. However, I believe there is no better example of this than Afzal Khan, whose actions were so egregious that I did a literal double take after learning about what this king had done. See, Afzal didn't just unalive one wife or a couple like history's favorite King Henry VIII. No, 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 my busy bees. He is responsible for the termination of 63 wives, not wives. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of guy would make that kind of mistake. <laughs> In fear of losing them to an invader who treated women slightly better, he had his soldiers give them a tall glass of drowning. Those who tried to escape were cut down without mercy. Yeah, I lived next door to the chief. He invited me in for a cup of tea. I sat down and he said, that ain't it. You know something's messed up if I'm overusing that joke. Number seven, 20 years of therapy. Elizabeth of Bosnia was a very unpopular queen and unfortunately had to often defend her throne with violence. As it turns out, this did not bode well. Many people wanted revenge and honestly, just to take her position of power. Elizabeth, understanding perhaps her times might be numbered, was going to try everything she could to keep her bloodline in power. The passing of her king husband only made things worse. In her attempts to escape the impending doom, she was captured and imprisoned by her new owners. She was eventually released. Oh, did I say released? I meant as punishment, she was strangled in front of her daughter. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'm more of a bumbling fool, but that just can't be healthy for you. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Number 6. Bad Divorce Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with a fellow kingdom or with a bigger one itself. Pedro of Castile, he married a young Blanche of Bourbon so France and Spain could just seem just a wee bit more snug. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower. Just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince wasn't coming to rescue this damsel in distress, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe as Pedro had her unalived. I was going to make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just awful really. I mean, imagine being locked up in a tower for a long time. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get a food delivery app up in that tower? Maybe. Number 5. Women's Rights Listen, it would be difficult to talk about this list without bringing it up. And ladies, all I want you to know is that you're gorgeous and I love you. But queens of the past, although they might be royalty, were severely lacking in rights. This is a time when men ruled, literally. And unfortunately, that means a lot of women got the raw end of the deal. Just as an example, women have only been able to vote in the United States since 1920. There was a lot of work that had to be done. Which sounds like a long time, but it really isn't. Women of the past, and especially the medieval world, basically needed a man to walk through their life, whether they liked it or not. Can't own property, business, can't sign contracts, basically everything they need to do has to go through their husbands first. Sure, royals had it easier, but I'd argue if someone could just unalive you or lock you away in a tower without consequence, do you really have rights at all to begin with? I don't know, I don't think so, that's not right. We're gonna do better, we'll do better. Number four. Herod the Not So Great. Herod the Great was the king of Judea in 37 BC. Herod the Great was also a monster. I know I've given Henry VIII grief for Anne Boleyn, but buddy here, he just throws out wives like it's his business. Uh, well, it kind of was, actually. He, he was a busy man, having an estimated 14 children with different wives. There's also a good chance that there was more, uh, being since that female births were just not recorded. He also unalived a lot of other people, too. Th th this guy was just so much of a tyrant that both Jewish and Christian faiths depict him as a tyrant. Way to go, dude. Nice. Number three, the mayor's alibi. All right, here's a modern one for you. Yes, I know the mayor is not a king. I understand that. But they still hold a decent amount of power, and this happened in the 90s, which I hate to bring up because that was a really long time ago. Yeah, I know, right? I know, I remember that too. Mayor Barry Waite and his wife were just as comfy as peas and carrots when one day his wife was mysteriously unalived. Barry was not a suspect at first, but slowly as time went on, his alibi began to unravel, and he seemed less and less trustworthy. As multiple financial-based scandals were beginning to rear their heads, it later became understood that his wife was going to seek legal aid after learning about Barry's doings, strangling her in a fit of rage. Years later, he was convicted and sentenced to 40 years in prison. So maybe we haven't learned much from our historical past. A man in power in fear of losing it to a woman. 
has removed her from the equation. I guess we'll never change. Number two, one last ride. King Philip V was down bad. The CEO of Naughty Time. This man liked to get down and to be a certain kind of dirty. He could not get enough of women. He loved them, his wives and mistresses included. Reported to try and get the deed done at least three times a day. Now you might be saying to yourself, but Big Chet, what's so wrong with that? Everyone likes a little mooey mooey once in a while. Hey, I hear you. A little toe curling once in a while, it's a great thing if you catch my drift. But Philip may have enjoyed it just a little too much, as when his beloved wife was on her deathbed, he tried to squeeze in one more D appointment. Your wife is dying and all you can think about is a little afternoon delight? A bouquet of flowers and I love you would have been fine, but who am I to judge? You, you go ahead. Weirdo. Number one, the last czar. Nicholas II of the Romanovs was the last czar of Russia. What did he do to his wife? Well, not much, actually, and, and that's the issue at hand. It's his inaction that hurt her and the family the most. You see, Russia was an interesting nation in the early 1900s. As most nations were modernizing, Russia was still somewhat stuck in the past. A lack of rights for anyone, no industry, and the monarch was kind of oppressive. Well, Nicholas the Tsar was going to change it. At some point, maybe. Uh, okay, well, he didn't. It would take a whole history class to break down what actually happened during those crucial years. But in a nutshell, there was this new fun idea called communism. And with the lack of the Tsar support to the people, and this is serious neglect we're talking about here, the people revolted. The monarchy was overthrown, and in an event that's actually quite sad, the Tsar and his whole family were unalive by the new government. His inaction got his wife done in. Way to go, Nikki. What, we gonna start with, why are you so stingy? You literally live in a castle. You have gold doubloons like an effing pirate, priceless spices stolen from foreign lands, and gemstones harvested fresh from the earth. But you're gonna have us measure every loaf of bread so they're the exact same? Back in the late 1500s, Viscount Montagu demanded meticulous records of every expenditure. The clerk of the kitchen was a crossbreed between an extreme couponer and a professional nitpicker. But to provide the cooks with the ingredients for every meal in exact amounts for each person to be served, and ensure that each plate had the exact same weight and proportions laid upon it. Among his many duties was also to ensure every wheat loaf that went in the oven weighed 18 ounces and was 16 ounces when it was taken out. What happens if they weighed more or less? Off to the bread breaking wheel, or maybe the sourdough slow slicer, off to the steak for a little French toasting, huh? Anyway, for how the British monarchy would pitch a fit over a three letter word, children, not kids. Because we all want to speak a little bit more like Mary Poppins. Oh yes, little children, off to bed we go. Nah, dude. I couldn't do the whole royal nanny thing, to be honest. The, the education required enough makes you think that they're scouting for NASA, not someone to stop their kid from picking its nose. Publicly, at least. Maria Barello, the nanny who takes care of Prince George, Princess Charlotte, and Prince Louis, trained at the notable Norland College in Bath, England before being hired to the world's most famous children. At this college, students like Borallo study early years development for three years. However, as well as learning social and emotional development, students are also taught the importance of vocabulary. There is one word that royal nannies are prohibited from using to describe royal children. Kids. Ask me why. Come on. Ask me. It's because of the exact honky dory dumbass reason you think. It's the baby goat thing. Kids is a name for them and an informal name for children because who says that it's not the Victorian era? According to Heron, the word kid is disrespectful and dissuades royal children from being seen as individuals. You mean like how sheltering them and not allowing them everyday friends or normal reality or exposure to the real world under the guise of safety, but it's more so they grow up in a bubble of unrealistic world perspective and can't understand problems morally and empathetically as an adult, only in a political sense. You mean like that? Sounds like what they're doing. Number 8. Avzal Khan Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty, slap on the wrist, naughty, don't do that, for shame. However, I would like to offer Avzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry, no, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right, 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. 
Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. <laughs> Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. While all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss, so much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather, uh, well, mistreatment of women, YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number five, Pedro of Castile. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. I gotta get, gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things. Someone to go through life with. Companionship. Love. And if you're lucky, someone who's a good cook or a baker. Oh, love me some baked goods. Mm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for an example, who loved loving his wife so much that, he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just, God, that doesn't seem right, you know? That just, let her, you know, let her, let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just, ah. Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate, like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own. Mm. And had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two. Pope John the 12th. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, th this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican, and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope Mobile is pretty sick, not gonna lie. However, Pope John the 12th was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages 
from God. This pope was doing a lot of anti-pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's a king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple bad things said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he's telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know. Starting with his entrusted and encrusted crap man. In Henry's court, his servants vied to be as physically close to the king as possible at all times. In case you aren't aware, especially towards the end of his reign, Henry was a tad bit of a lunatic. The more he liked you, the less likely you were to die for looking at him funny on a bad day of his. But naturally, the monarch reserved the honor of being close to his royal person only for a trusted few people. The grooms of the stools. No, not his counselor, personal butler, none of his advisor, the guy that wiped his ass. And during his reign, only four men got the gig of groom of the stool, the most physically intimate position and therefore the most honored of his attendants. These grooms not only helped dress and undress the king before and after the bathroom and, you know, handled the poop brush for him, but in an insane twist, they also controlled public and personal access to the monarch and some of his finances. They even had power over a stamp of the king's signature, which is a major financial tool. Imagine being one of his wives and having to ask the guy who wipes your husband's ass if you can talk to him and he says no. But if he could afford that kind of luxury employee, why was he called the copper nosed king? Easy. While Henry's kingdom amassed a great wealth and property during the English Reformation by confiscating Catholic monasteries, Henry then turned around and drove England into debt with his overspending and lavish lifestyle. Dude was a complete eclectic and he wanted to buy everything shiny and pretty he saw, so he did. It's reported by the time he dropped, Henry he owned approximately 50 palaces, 6,500 plus weapons, 70 ships, 78 recorders, 78 flutes, 5 sets of bagpipes, and a virginal. Get your mind out of the gutter, it's a type of harpsichord. Not to mention the millions of dollars he pumped into wars with Scotland and France. So it's pretty obvious he was burning through the kingdom's funds and by the end of his reign, Henry had it down to the pocket change, quite literally. He was forced to lower the percentage of silver in the British coinage to the point that they were mostly copper with the silver coating that wore away from the coins embossed image of Henry's face, starting with the nose, thus copper nose. When Henry's son Edward took the throne, the royal coffers were in a real bad state. In our number eight spot today, we have Chen Shi Huang. While this leader is often credited with creating the first unified Chinese empire, the Qin Dynasty, these accomplishments didn't come cheap. When he came to power in 221 BCE, he strictly followed seven principles, which not only pushed for severe punishment, but also acted in contraries and issued unattainable orders. He also is said to have been extremely paranoid about the power of the educated, which led to him burning books so that no one could ever learn what was in them, and he also killed 460 Confucian scholars in just one year, which some claim was because they were unable to make him immortal. Huang wanted not only to establish a transport system, but also build a wall to keep out enemies, and this meant that he had to relocate at least 120,000 families. He declared that all would be equal under one law, and then tax everyone heavily, and because of these heavy taxes as well as the insane labor that was expected to create the wall and the transport system, thousands of people were overworked, starved, and perished. He also had laborers create a massive tomb for him, complete with 8,000 life-size terracotta warriors and horses, which you may be familiar with because now it is rumored to be an extremely haunted place. I mean an evil ruler's resting place? Yeah, of course it's haunted. In our number 7 spot today, we have Don Carlos. I'll be honest, this little troublemaker 
Peter never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kind of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias during the mid 1500s as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to the inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors though are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things like hurting or taking the lives of animals just for fun. I mean nowadays we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then they just chalked it up to boys being boys. It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Red flags, they were abundant. Soon of course his cruelties would extend to humans with people claiming that one time he chose to whip a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made the prince that he didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided there's no way in hell. Like he was so bad, she would rather marry his dad, which she did in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement, where he passed away six months later. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him happy hacking up knights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was totally abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances bricked up. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number 5 spot today, we have Nero. For this one, we are going to be taking it all the way back to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful times. Times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, he burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal all of these were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality as well as his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 4 spot today, we have Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the leader of the Cambodian revolutionary group called the Khmer Rogue, and this group with him at the forefront went on to try and destroy the Cambodian civilization. This wasn't necessarily how the group started out, but once Paul and others who shared his ideals came to lead it, things quickly became very dark. He is likely one of the only people who ordered a mass jet in his own country. The reasoning behind all of this is because he believed that destroying the civilization was the best way to start a new regime and bring in a new age. He ended up serving as the Prime Minister from 1976 until 1979, during which his policies led to the deaths of around 2 million people, which is horrifying. That was about 25% of the entire population. He even liked to keep the skulls of those he had killed. Just gonna say, it seems as though politics was the mask for someone who just really wanted to kill people. There are so many horrific details surrounding him and the things he did, much of which I can't even repeat here on YouTube, and that is exactly how he landed a spot here on today's list. He truly did some horrendous things, and in the end, 
and went on to live the rest of his life and died of natural causes before he could even answer for any of his crimes, which is just the most frustrating end to a horrible tale. In our number three spot today, we have Maximilian Robespierre. Okay, I'll be honest. This is quite a polarizing one. Maximilian, on one hand, was great. He advocated for universal suffrage, for unrestricted admission to national posts, and he was against racial and religious discrimination. Especially in the time he ruled in, this was huge. Of course people were against him, but in our modern views, he was way ahead of his time in these beliefs. On the other hand, however, he was extremely violent and was the leader during most of the French reign of terror that happened during the revolution. It is said that during this time, he was responsible for imprisoning somewhere around 300,000 and killing somewhere around 40,000. During the revolution in 1793, he was elected head of the Committee of Public Safety, and from that point on, any voice that was in opposition to the change that was happening was struck down and silenced by him. Throughout the years, his ego and power only grew, which led to him being a little too quick to use the guillotine, his favorite execution method. He was getting a little too cozy with that thing, so much so that he began to use it even on people who had, at one time, been his allies. We saw this clearly when it came to the execution of George Danton, who Maximilian had executed after he suggested maybe chilling out on the whole reign of terror thing. In the end, people caught on to this tendency for violence and horrible punishments, which definitely lost some of his public support, and this was only exacerbated when it was realized that he now had beliefs that directly contradicted those he had earlier, like when he tried to create a national religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being. By the time 1794 came around, he was overthrown, and later that year he found himself being executed by, you guessed it, the guillotine. Not good. No thanks. In our number two spot today, we have Vlad Tepes, often referred to as Vlad the Impaler. He was the ruler of Wallachia three times between 1448 until his death in 1476. He is often regarded as one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history, and to many, he is a hero, and this is not to disregard that. But you don't get a nickname like the Impaler by being a passive, peaceful guy. Vlad was known for his brutality and his love of impaling people, but it is also also said that everyone's favorite vampire, Dracula, was modeled after him. This is because it is rumored that Vlad liked to dip his bread in the blood of his enemies before eating it. I prefer a little olive oil and balsamic vinegar with mine, but hey, to each his own, I guess. Vlad is known for his intimidation tactics, which included having bodies of those he had killed lined up outside of the city so that any enemies approaching would know what fate they had coming. Like I mentioned before, many regard Vlad as a hero. I mean, it is abundantly clear clear that he fought as hard as he could to protect Romania and Bulgaria from the Ottomans, but that doesn't mean that the horrific things he did have been forgotten either. Vlad definitely left quite the legacy behind when he was killed in 1476. In our number one spot today, we have Joseph Stalin. Stalin was a Georgian revolutionary and Soviet political leader who governed the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. Despite the fact that he started his time governing the country as a part of a collective leadership, by the 1930s he had consolidated consolidated all of the power and went on to begin acting as the Soviet Union's dictator. During his reign, Stalin was responsible for the deaths of over 60 million people, 20 million of them being his own. Apparently the math works out to about 40,000 people per week, which is just unbelievable. For almost 30 years, he reigned the Soviet Union with terror and violence. I mean, his decisions led to a famine that killed millions of people. Also, the lives he took weren't just of his enemies. I mean, how could one person have 60 million enemies? He would take the lives of families of people he liked. He just took too many lives, was too paranoid, and while he was powerful and smart, he could also be an absolute monster. Number 10. What's yours is mine. Maintaining a dynasty and trying to rule over a people is hard. Many people have done it in the past, but if you notice, there isn't that many kingdoms left. So, it's no surprise that in Egypt, one of the largest and most successful civilizations of the ancient world and of all time, had some political strife. Berenice III had lost her husband Ptolemy, and she was doing her best to maintain power. In some serious Alabama energy, Ptolemy XI was made king, a stepson and half-brother. The man wanted it all to himself. And can you blame him? I mean, look at the pyramids. Nice. I'd want him too. He promptly unalived his new queen because power moves. 
Some people didn't like this. And in some form of poetic justice, he was unalived. By the people. What's the lesson in this one? Maybe that you can't trust your strange, closely knit inbred family members? I'm not sure, honestly, but it's, it's just messed up. Number 9. Double Trouble this one isn't exactly about a king removing a queen like his wife, but it is about kings ceasing the life of their queen, more specifically their mother. Clericus and Oxythrus were the sons of Amistris, a woman handed off in marriage by the mad lad Macedonian himself, Alexander the Great. Well, like a lot of ye olde history, there was some power struggles. A power vacuum had been created in the death of Dionysus. You'd think that wouldn't happen over and over again, but You'll find that a lot in history. The power struggle was solved and eventually Amistris retired and remarried. Named the town after herself. Things were okay for Amistris. Things were good. But one day her sons came to visit and noticed the mom looked a little thirsty. So they drowned her in a river in a power grab that pretty much immediately backfired as they too were unalived by the next guy in line. Pretty similar to the last story, but that's history, isn't it? Number eight, William the Second. Usually being overshadowed by his father William the Conqueror and his successor Henry I, William II wasn't a well-liked king, particularly by the church, because William kept positions for bishops empty so he could take their incomes, which made me laugh when I read it actually. The Archbishop of Canterbury Anselm really had an issue with William even going into exile until William ceased to live. But this just left the revenues of the Archbishop of Canterbury vacant, making William able to claim those funds as well until the end of his reign. He obviously was not a fan of the church, but his armies definitely were a fan of him. He was great when it came to warfare, and was able to pretty much guarantee loyalty by showing it. William didn't have any heirs or wives, which led people to question his preferences, if you know what I mean. He ultimately met his end at the tip of an arrow during a hunting accident, but he was always remembered for being ruthless and giving in to his vices. Number 7. Morad IV Something about kings being great also goes hand in hand with them being terrible at the same time. 17th Sultan of the Ottoman throne, Murad IV came to power in September 1623 at the age of 11. But since he was so young, the Ottomans were ruled by his mother, Kosim Sultan, and other relatives, who did a pretty horrendous job. As a tween, he walked around the cities dressed as a commoner and would keep a list of those he could benefit from and those he could punish at 11. At 21, he took control and also took some extreme precautions in order to eliminate the corruption within the empire, banning the use of alcohol and tobacco, and coming up with severe measurements for the regular collection of taxes. Murad IV would never be okay with people disobeying his laws and directives, even going around the city in plain clothes to check any undisciplined actions by the locals, and he would personally punish the offenders. He did a lot for the Ottomans, but boy was he harsh about it. He destroyed coffee houses, like, come on man. Number 6. Phalaris Phalaris of Acragas was a tyrannical Sicilian ruler from around 571 to 554 BC. And this dude was so bad, his own people overthrew him after his 16 years of rule. Phalaris became ruler by some unconventional ways when it came to other kings on this list. Some think he started as a farmer who held office, and other more fun stories say he was appointed to build a temple, and instead of doing that, he took the money and built a fortress, allowing him to take power. He expanded the territory of Acragas from the south coast of Sicily all the way up to the north coast, but he was known much better for how gosh darn cruel he was. The most famous story would have to be the one of the brazen bull. An engineer was hired by Phalaris to create a new device for doing heinous things to his prisoners. The engineer presented him with a bronze bull. There was a door that could be opened to place a prisoner inside, then they would light a fire underneath, heating up the bull and causing the poor soul inside to thrash about and yell, making the bull seem alive. He then used it on the engineer. Thanks to the citizens revolt though, he got to be the last victim of the bull. Looks like karma's a bull. <laughs> Number 5. Louis XIV King of France, the Sun King, the God Given Ruling from 1638 to 1715, Louis XIV was well known for his love of art, which was apparent in the royal palace of Versailles he created. His love of women for his multiple wives and many more mistresses, and the comparison of himself to God. Even taking up the sun as his symbol, being representative of Apollo, the sun god, and the literal reason we're all alive. A good symbol, honestly. 
The Palace of Versailles was used to host comedies, operas, and tragedies, and spectacular parties. His suite in the palace was made up of three apartments, all for himself. The palace was big enough to hold his entire court so that none of them could really plot against him without him knowing. It also contained the Hall of Mirrors, which was a 71 meter long room with 357 mirrors around 17 arches opposite the massive windows. Unlike most other kings on this list, Louis XIV was a fantastic ruler. He was an incredibly lavish one though, which equals spoiled in my mind. Number four. Ivan the Terrible. Ivan Tsar was a great military leader, pretty much setting up the Russian Empire. A great leader with an absolutely terrible temper. His rage filled outbursts just got worse and worse over the years of his rule from 1530 to 1584. One of these incidents even ending in the stab filled demise of his own son. He had a special force called the Oprichina who eliminated anybody he felt threatened him, and he led this force to Novograd in 1572, resulting in the massacre of Novograd, which gets him a firm place as one of the cruelest of Russian rulers. There is the even more popular story of him making that uh, peculiar looking castle in Moscow, and then dispatching the man who designed it so no one else could have one. He is one of the most cruel, paranoid, bad tempered, and greedy rulers in not just Russian history, but history in general. Literally terrible. Number three, Nero. Another Roman emperor who was effectively insane. Hmm, seems to be like a trend. Best known for his spicy parties, political delifings, persecution of Christians, and love for music that led to the rumor that Nero played the fiddle while Rome burned during the Great Fire of 64 AD, Nero first became emperor at 17, and the first little bit of his rule saw him be responsible for the demise of multiple people, including his mother and his newest wife, Poppea in a casual outburst of rage. He was quite the artist, singing and performing and encouraging others to take lessons, and he held sport events all the time, even taking part himself. Remember that fire I talked about? Well, some people believe he may have started it himself in order to make a bigger palace. But if he did or didn't, he blamed the Christians and punished them much more than necessary, like dressing them in animal skins and having them torn apart by dogs, or being burned to the afterlife in pyres that would light his own garden parties. Oh, and he bankrupt the Roman treasury building the aforementioned palace where he held his ridiculous parties we talked about before with a 100 foot golden statue of himself. Nice. Number two, bad King John. Kings be bad sometimes. But when it came to lechery, treachery, and shocking acts of cruelty, the king who sealed the Magna Carta takes the cake. According to the historians at least. While known for the Magna Carta, he is also well known as the king involved in the stories of Robin Hood. But these being fairy tales, was he really that bad? No! He was much, much, much worse! During the time that he ruled, most nobles who were captured in war were kept in not so bad confinement. John said no though. Like when he captured his own nephew, who miraculously disappeared, and about 22 knights who were sent to a castle to starve to the afterlife, to stop their families from continuing to fight. He did the same thing to the wife and son of his former friend. If that weren't bad enough, when his brother, who was king at the time, was taken prisoner, he tried to seize the throne. And he is famous for forcing himself on the wives and daughters of his own barons. As you may remember from Robin Hood, there was a monetary aspect to his horribleness as well. The taxes and fines he levied were to the point of extortion. I talked to Andrew, who talked to the chief, and he said, King John ain't it. Number one, Henry VIII. Ah, here we are, the main man himself. We've talked about him before, and how could we not? He's arguably one of the most infamous English kings. Historians have described him as obsessive, syphilitic, and a self-indulgent wife delifer and tyrant. These historians probably leave the best Google reviews. It's not just his whole multiple wives to find a male heir situation that makes him spoiled. Well, kind of it is. To achieve his personal ends, he literally spurred on a religious revolution that created the Church of England, the formal end of monasteries, and the Reformation. Which is hilarious because he wrote a treatise against Martin Luther that had him named Defender of the Faith by the Pope. Ironic. He, like many of the others, was a lover of art, music, and sport, at least in his younger years. But he was also an incredibly costly ruler. While he unified much of England with Wales and Ireland, in 1520, with King Francis I of France, Henry co-hosted the Field of the Cloth of Gold, which was incredibly lavish and showed off his immaturity. 
Speaking of immaturity, there are tons of cases where people were separated from their heads simply for not giving him what he wanted, including some of his friends and his wives. A great number one for this list, in my opinion. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ivan the Fourth, more commonly known as Ivan the Terrible. He was the son of Vasily the Third, who is the Rurikid ruler of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. After his father's death, however, at just three years old, Ivan was named the Grand Prince, and by the time he was 16, he was declared as the Tsar or Emperor of Russia, officially establishing the Tsardom of Russia. Ivan and his reign are certainly known for the transformation of Russia from a medieval state to an empire, but not without a huge cost to the people of Russia, as well as a hit to the long term economy. Ivan has been described as being intelligent and devout, but also prone to paranoia, rage, and episodic outbreaks of mental instability that only increased the older he got. One of the main points of extreme violence and viciousness was the massacre of Novgorod, which saw the deaths of an estimated 2,000 to 15,000 people, as well as a shocking amount of acts of extreme, violent cruelty. In the later years, like I mentioned, his violent tendencies only got worse, which led to him doing things like striking his heir in the heat of an argument so badly that it left him with brain damage. In the end, Ivan the Terrible met his demise from a heart attack in 1584. Yeah, they say that impaling hundreds of people every day isn't great for the heart health. Someone should have let him know about vitamins and minerals, or maybe some good cardio heavy exercise. I don't know. In our number 9 spot today, we have Leopold II. As the second king of the Belgians, Leopold has been said to be responsible for the deaths of somewhere between 2 to 15 million people. Yeah, million. It wasn't in Belgium that he committed his atrocious acts, however. It all started when he claimed himself to be the founder and sole owner of the Congo Free State, which was a private project he undertook on his own. Leopold loved colonialism. He wanted to colonize everything he possibly could, and this is why he started the International African Society, which he used to travel to Africa, claim land that obviously wasn't his, and we're not talking about a small piece. We're talking about land that is several times the size of Belgium, and many countries just let him do this and allowed him to freely rule this land. This is definitely already bad enough, but of course things only got worse. Leopold had his own private militia that he used to force the indigenous population into hard labor. While Leopold was doing this, of course for economic reasons, he also was just doing this because he was a messed up guy. He was terrible. He made those who lived here harvest and process rubber, and the punishments for those who didn't harvest enough for him were extremely severe. Not to mention, it also said that sometimes he would just inflict harm because he could. Eventually, a stop needed to be put to his wrongdoings, but of course he was going to do everything he could to hide some of the horrors he did. The entire archive of the Congo Free State was burned, and he told his aide that even though the Congo had been taken from him, quote, they have no right to know what I did there. The Congo was taken from him, but remained under the rule of Belgium in 1908 until the Congo was given independence in 1960. As for Leopold, well, he remained the ruler of Belgium until his death in 1909, but the secret was out now, and no one liked him. In fact, his funeral procession was booed by the crowd because everyone was angry at him for the things that he had done. Oh. Number 8. Filippo Maria Visconti The Duke of Milan during the 14th century was at first Gian Maria Visconti, but after he was taken out, his brother, Filippo Maria Visconti, had to step up to the bat. As a ruler, Filippo was better. His brother had been cruel previously, hence the untimely departure. So this was a good move at first, so we thought. Now Filippo had to take over come 1412. Filippo was better than his brother on paper. He helped reorganize government finances. He got the silk industry up and running, which we love that. He ended up passing away of natural causes down the road, which is, you know, nothing like his brother. But while he was in power, he never showed his face to anybody, not even people close to him. He hid in his palace most of the time, and it was odd because he thought that he was ugly. That's why he hid his face. Kind of sad, right? Filippo hid his face, and maybe you feel bad for him now, right? Just a little bit. He died of natural causes, and he was alone all that time. Yeah, don't feel bad for him. This guy was horrible. He was jealous of his wife Beatrice Lascaris de Tenda because she was twice his age, twice as smart, and twice as powerful. So, Filippo had her taken out in a courtyard publicly September 13th, 1418. Yeah, he accused her of adultery just cause, cause he could and he had some suspicions in his dark room by himself hiding his face. History is ugly and sometimes it's literally ugly as well. Number seven, George the First. 
King George I, couple of Georges on this list, okay? Long before his British ruling days, George was in Germany. He was actually the elector there, and he'd been married before around 1682. Originally, he married Sophia Dorothea of Seal, but the entire time they were married, it was horrible. George would straight up bring other women home because he just felt like he could. Like, he, li he literally argued that he could, given his role. He's like, oh, I could have these women, and we could do all this in front of you? Of course, I'm this person of this. Like, no, you're a fool, you're a jerk, really. He would have numerous mistresses and he would purposely flaunt them. So Sophia thought, okay, if you can have numerous side hustles going on, I'll move on myself. So she began seeing a Swedish count. <laughs> okay. She began seeing Philip Christoph von Konigsmark. Now when George inevitably found out, he was violent at this point. He was upset, he divorced Sophia and then imprisoned her. Yeah, when he became king of Britain later on in 1714, she didn't come with him. Yeah, it's not just horrible with Sophia either. The Duke had also been taken out, sadly. His love for Sophia ended up getting him killed. What a mess. All these Georges are so messy. The worst. If your name's George, don't be a mess. Just be nice. Hit that thumbs up if you're a George. Change the game. Change the stats up. Number six, heir to the throne. Okay, I kicked off this list roasting Napoleon and his licorice choices, but of course, he's done much worse things than have bad breath and stained teeth. Napoleon's marriage to Josephine was first fueled by love and friendship, but things quickly changed. Marie Josephine Rose Tasher de la Pagerie was born in 1763. She had two children with her first husband, but that marriage was also not a happy time. They separated, and Josephine met Napoleon in 1795. Napoleon, at this point, was married at the time and they had an affair and they were deeply in love, like actually in love, and Napoleon proposed to Josephine in 1796 and they married later that year. Two days after their wedding, Napoleon led the French army in Italy and while he was gone, both of them ended up having affairs. So many affairs in this, like does love even exist? What the hell? 1804, Napoleon crowned himself and then crowned Josephine, proclaiming her empress. A few years passed and after finding out Josephine couldn't bear any more children, Napoleon made a list of possible and eligible princesses. Just a list and just left it out, like how, how awful is that? In November 1809, Josephine agreed to the divorce and come 1821, Napoleon Bonaparte's final word on his deathbed was Josephine. Yeah, a little darker than licorice, just a tad. Number five, King Henry VIII. The second wife of King Henry VIII. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Bolin. She had also apparently, apparently, had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close, I mean, they were really close. He was the groom of the stool. So they were close and on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Hmm, I wonder why. This list will explain a few reasons. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish. Anne wasn't present when these events even went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I. So there's no way she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533, your honor. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill, May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her own little neck before being taken out with the sword herself. Yeah, all dark. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. Somebody had to get an old elm chest from the Tower Armory. How horrible is that? Number four, a bit better, another one of King Henry VIII's wives, Anne of Cleves. Where do we even begin here? This one is, honestly, this one's pretty sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic, in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, King Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister, and then come back and compare them. This is like the birth of Tinder. I'm not even joking, this is how he did it. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. Yeah, compared her to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site, write that in. I praiseth thou beauty, madam, to a silver dollar. A silver sea sand dollar shining in the moon. What, I don't know, just click it. Just click send, see what happens. Then a treaty was signed, a few weeks later Anne arrived to England and Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like the portrait, apparently. How horrible is that? Ah, you look nothing like this Victorian painting. How dare you? It's 6 a.m. and you've been riding a horse for four weeks and you don't look like this Victorian painting? Shame. He tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. And on January 6, 1540, their marriage was official. You can't unswipe this marriage, rich boy. And later accepted the divorce, gladly, and then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Number three, Christian VII. Christian, there's an ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. 
the prince that couldn't keep his hands out of his pants. I don't know how else to say it. Here we go. Christian VII of Denmark. He was, he was a young lad, he was spoiled. He was a little comfortable with his body, maybe too comfortable. And he would often just have his hands in his pants hanging out. He was like one of those, you know, rich king. He was kind of like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. He would just have his, just sit back and like suck on candy and stuff and just, you know, fool around. I don't know, it was gross. Middle of dinner, this guy would pass around food to his family with those gross hands. He would alternate hands and pants to handing out food. What a little twerp. Now it's unknown, but historians believe maybe, just maybe, he was a tad mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks. Go wash your hands. Twice. Number two, King Henry VIII, again. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII again, again. He's pretty bad, not gonna lie. Henry VIII was King of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times, as we've heard by now, and all of them have went south. When Henry married Catherine, he was 49. She was a few years younger. She was actually a lot younger, classic 1500s, way too young. And when they got married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had received a nasty jousting wound, so now he was gravely overweight. He didn't do anything. He just laid around all day and complained. So Catherine, of course, just wanted some, you know, shred of a life and being again quite young, too young, she decided to look for love. Well, God forbid, God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s because then the young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. And finally, coming in at number one, Henry II. The relationship between Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine is pretty memorable. It's memorable in all the wrong ways, of course. When they first met, things were good, dare I say, with both of them. They were both young, and he was gonna be king. He was young, king, guy, young man who's gonna be king. And Eleanor, I mean, she was married, but once she got an annulment, their love was good. You know, their love was good and young and ready to be young king stuff. After the annulment in 1152, Henry and Eleanor tied the knot officially a couple weeks after. Love moves quickly, apparently. Henry started having affairs, because of course he did. At this point in his list, we're not gasping at affairs, sadly. But come 1173, Eleanor had convinced their sons to go against father. <sighs> yeah, Henry didn't take this well, and he had Eleanor locked up for 16 years. He had died, so after that point, she had resumed the royal roles, because at this point, those two boys had grown up and inherited the throne, Richard and John. But being locked up for that long, what a nightmare that relationship was entirely. I figured we'd end on a kind of tame one, one where she kind of came back and it was good. Kind of good, dare I say? I don't know. Number 10, the young czar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too, even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9, Nero Steam. We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives, wait, that's, we gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that's theatrics are important. Remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. But if someone does lay beyond those walls and it's not Nefertiti, then knock knock, 
Who's there? Few scholars share Reeves' optimism that any new chambers contain Nefertiti's tomb. There's something about her specifically that fills archaeologists with dread and defeat like she's the popular hot girl at school who would never look at them. The desire to find her mummy is potent as it would be a tremendous discovery and greatly contribute to the study of ancient Egypt. Frank Rahil of the University of Zurich compiled a list of other royal relatives that he felt could be interred there, including Tut's older sister, Mary Hatton, his possible mother Kia, and of course, Smen Kahara. There is a belief, however, that if it is Smen, while well, Nefertiti died, Tut had her interred with him. Possibly because, as mentioned, the dude could be his dad, but also maybe Tut knew his mom loved this guy more than Ak. I don't know, I don't got time for ancient Egyptian Kardashian drama right now. All I'm saying is, is Tut could have cracked that tomb open, buried Nefertiti, closed it back up, and when he died, he got buried in the front most room. But to appeal to my ancient alien theorists, is it alien matter? On the flip side of educated leaps, we have alien conspiracy. Egypt's own antiquities ministry announced a few years ago that there were signs of extraterrestrial activity discovered after some radar scans of King Tut's tomb. The radar scans, according to French archaeologist Avril Sapp, refuted theories that Queen Nefertiti's tomb is hidden beyond that of King Tut, and instead revealed weird and extraterrestrial material appeared to resemble a body. However, both Sapp and unnamed antiquity officials refused to answer questions concerning whether or not it could be alien remains. But the AO did confidently boast they could not even come up with something like this in the National Treasure or Indiana Jones movies. This is revolutionary. We don't know what there is, but we've never seen results like this before, said Sapp, who coincidentally discovered dinosaur bones in the Pyramid of Giza a few years ago on April 1st, 2014. Whatever's inside of there could hold secrets to everything behind ancient Egyptian history and technology. Egypt will continue to conduct radar testings and scannings to determine how to enter the hidden chamber without damaging anything inside. Next on the roster, how do you die? One important question that's likely never going to be answered by anything that might be contained in newly discovered chambers is how Tut died. Let's run through some of the many options, shall we? Was it A, King Tut's knee was broken so badly that it was a compound, the bone piercing the skin and causing massive bleeding. Although a fatal leg fracture fits the idea that Tut had died abruptly, it cannot be stated for medical certainty that the fracture occurred while Tut was alive. It's possible his knee was broken after death. Was it B, Tut's death was caused by an infection that resulted from said fracture. Not the result of a chariot crash, by the way, since Tut's physical impairments would have made chariot racing impossible. His immune system was weakened from several bouts of malaria. But maybe it was C. Tut may have been killed by an elderly chief advisor and successor, I. An x-ray of his skull revealed calcified blood clot at the base, and it could have been caused by a blow from a blunt instrument. Or maybe it's D. New analysis of CT scans from 03 show Tut was embalmed without his heart and interior chest wall, structures that couldn't have been removed by tomb robbers or anyone else. The assumed cause was an extensive crushing and tearing injury like the bite of a hippopotamus. Despite not knowing how he died, we know after he did, there was a big ol' succession mess. Post Tut, the pharaoh get plot gets all dicey. Horma was the chosen heir for the throne and was off waging war against the Hittites. The coup theory for Tut's death revolved around his elderly chief advisor I, because we do not know how or why a high official like him came to be king of Egypt otherwise. He definitively stole the crown and throne from Horame in his absence though. Ancient letters suggest that either Nefertiti or more likely Tut's widow Akinsenamun was desperate to prevent Ai from becoming pharaoh and asked the king of the Hittites, who they are at literal war with, to send a prince who could marry her and rule Egypt. An and Nefertiti are erased from history around that time. During his short reign, King Ai tried in vain to achieve peace with said Hittites, while also simultaneously trying to prevent Horame, the true regent of Tut, from seizing the throne while he's alive and after he died. To do so, he named an heir, an army commander named Nakahimti, who we know as perhaps to be Ai's own grandson. As you can imagine, Nakahimti became Horambe's great rival, but Ai's successor would finally be Horam when his three year reign ends. Horam would then rule for nearly 30 years and then remove all known history of Tut and TAA, Nefertiti, and Tut's father, Ah. Now that's a mystery as to why. And while we're on the topic, where is An? For over 3,000 years, her life has been a mystery to us and mostly made up of bizarre facts and strange omissions. Like that despite being the third daughter of the pharaoh, she was once his wife too, before marrying her half-brother, Tut. <laughs> when Tut died, the corrupt priests chose an heir, General Harambe, known lunatic. Anne was terrified and realized the kingdom was being lost to corruption in secret societies. She potentially writes to 
the king Hittites during their time of war as mentioned, offering herself and the throne of Egypt to one of his sons. The prince in specific was Zanzania, and he set out for Egypt and is killed before he arrives. Historians believe this was Horemheb's doing. And is forced to marry Ai so he can steadfastly secure his place on the throne, and then like that, she vanishes from history, an absence that some historians say signal her death. But it isn't the only time that has fragmented her story. An's role of ancient Egypt's most contentious period was lost deliberately, excised from the annals of history by the new dynasty that rose to power just decades later. DNA testing she may have been one of the female mummies found in Key V21, but for now she remains shrouded in mystery. The story of the Cobra and Canary is next. Howard Carter, self-taught archaeologist, plunderer, thief, and is responsible for the discovery and opening of King Tut's tomb. Prior to said opening, he had bought a golden canary, hoping its chatter and song would cheer up his empty house. When he first brought it home, one of his housemates tells Carter, "It's a bird of gold that will bring luck. This year we will find a tomb full of gold." Well, howdy doody, either that bird summoned gold or the maid is a fortune teller. Within a week of purchasing the canary, Carter discovers Tut's tomb, and before knowing whose tomb they had found, the workers nicknamed it the Tomb of the Golden Bird, a bird that becomes an omen of what's to come. During the recent excavations which led to the discovery of the tomb of Tuck Muhammad, Mr. Howard Carter had in his house a canary which daily regaled him with its happy song. On the day however, on which the entrance to the tomb was laid bare, a cobra entered the house, pounced on the bird and swallowed it. Now cobras are rare in Egypt and seldom seen in winter, but in ancient times they were regarded as symbol of royalty, and each pharaoh wore the symbol upon his forehead as though to signify his power to strike and sting his enemies. And obviously this segue is us to the classic mystery of the mummy's curse. I'm of the opinion anyone who pillages or destroys history deserves to have a curse, so Howard Carter and company, please continue rolling in your graves, bud, you earned this. So George Herbert funded the excavation and died from blood poisoning days later. Legend has it when the Lord Carnivon died, all the lights in his house and in Cairo, Egypt mysteriously went out. Howard Carter gave a mummified hand wearing a bracelet inscribed saying, cursed he be who moves my body, to his friend Bruce ink him as a gift, ink him that man did not like you. His house burned to the ground not long after and when he tried to rebuild it was hit by a flood. George J. Gould dies after one visit. Aubrey Herbert dies of gum rot. Hugh Evelyn White takes his own life but not before writing in blood I have succumbed to the curse which forces me to disappear. Aaron Ember and his whole family dies and Richard Bethel is suffocated by apparently the Satanist Aleister Crowley of all people. Archibald Douglas Richard died three days after x-raying Tut, and then James Henry Breasted dies on his next Egypt trip. Mystery or what do you think? And last on our list is the alien jewel. The amazing story began 77 years after Carter's discovery when an Italian geologist noticed something odd about the yellow green scar up in the pectoral center. The subsequent tests proved that the lump of glass was older than any Egyptian society, a lot older in fact. Experts trace this scar up back to the Great Sand Sea, 500 miles Miles southwest of Cairo, in which there are known to be huge lumps of glass poking out of the dunes. The general opinion is that a meteor hit the desert hundreds of thousands of years ago, heating the sand enough to create glass. To give you the idea of the magnitude that this supposed impact, the first AB testing done created a thin frost-like layer of glass in the New Mexico desert. Meanwhile, chunks of glass the size of literal human heads can be picked up from the Great Sand Sea to this day. That means this meteor hit with an impact that we humans can't recreate on a different type of scale. But there's no evidence of a meteor that has ever struck the desert. If this glass is of meteoric origin, then there should be a crater of that age, says Boston University Farouk Al-Baz. But no crater, let alone partially fused or a serial piece, has ever been found. This suggests the less exciting origin, a super saturated lake of silica that slowly dried into a natural glass hard enough to resist a scalpel mark. So the first one is 800 dogs. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's that's it. This man right here, 800 dogs. Why? Maybe he want to star in his own remake of Air Buddy franchise, but with a Bollywood twist? I'm not sure. I'm not him. I don't know. And who is he? The Maharaja of Junagadh, Muhammad Mahabat Khan III. Now that is a name. All right. So that title in Sanskrit means great ruler, but I think last ruler is a little bit more accurate because that's exactly what Muhammad was before his negligence in decision making during the Indian independence of August 1947. Put 
put him out of a job. He screws up spectacularly, chooses that Junagadh should accede to Pakistan, and quite literally gets ran the hell out of Junagadh by Indian government. He lives out the rest of his life in exile, but enough about the man, let's hear about the dog. So, as mentioned, 800 is a real guaranteed number, but varying accounts actually say he may have owned as many as 2,000 dogs in one time period. Each dog had its own personal room in the palace, fitted with furnishings, their own servant, and of course, phones, so that the dogs can call each other. I don't know. Dog died, state of mourning's declared. Two dogs bang one out, now there's a new litter of puppies. Gotta make sure they're married, so it's not bastard puppies. This man reportedly spent 20 lakh, aka 2 million, on a dog wedding, and proclaimed it a state holiday. He's done the same for their birthdays as well. This next story can be abbreviated simply to the PPVRM. What's that stand for? Peppy, the pygmy, and the very rich man. Hakov was one of history's earliest explorers, 4,000 years ago in the 23rd century BC. He made his living wandering out into uncharted lands. But on his fourth expedition into the unknown, the pharaoh's scribe had messaged him to drop everything and return at once. Harkov had sent a letter to the king some time ago describing a friendly pygmy clan Harkov had encountered. The pharaoh at the time, Pepe II, who was an eight-year-old nightmare child, who do you know, happened to be obsessed with pygmies, and quickly wrote back, you said in this letter of yours that you have brought a pygmy of divine dances from the land of the horizon dwellers. Hurry and bring that pygmy you have brought alive, happy, and well for the divine dances to gladden the heart, to delight the heart of the king. Such was life under the rule of an eight-year-old, so Harkov returned to Egypt, pygmy in tow. But all of the letters from the pharaohs, this letter from Pepe meant a great deal to Harkov. He literally had it engraved on the walls of his tomb. This was a dude who discovered the lands around Egypt far and wide, served many pharaohs, and even, even single-handedly talked a kingdom out of war. So why so gassed over delivering a petite person to a child? Pepe loaded Harkov up, that's why. Homeboy spent the rest of his life as an incredibly wealthy and powerful man through that payment. After a lifetime of discovering distant kingdoms, opening trade routes, and bringing back exotic discoveries, Harkov finally made his fortune just by entertaining a child. I would have been grinning ear to ear too, dude. This story is a bumblebee classic, because this king is a pure kook. And and speaking of the Windsors, did y'all know Charles specifically sucks? A lot of kings imposed a lot of rules for their servants, but something about King Charles gets the most under the skin. Maybe it's because he had some pretty frivolous, unrealistic asks for a man who just got the throne this year? So listen to his tea procedure alone. Charles is very particular for how his tea is served when he's visiting the Paladinian house. When preparing the tea, you must use a teaspoon measurement of tea leaves per cup, and then there must be an exact temperature of 7 degrees Celsius for green tea and 100 degrees Celsius for Earl Grey or English breakfast. The prince's hot beverage must also be checked with a thermometer before being served, and honey should always be used to sweeten the tea rather than sugar. When serving the tea to the prince, the teaspoon should be situated precisely to the right underneath of the handle of the cup. Clive Goodman, a royal reporter for News of the World, claimed that Prince Charles does nothing himself. He described the morning scene in which Charles gets ready for the day, but all the preparation is done for him. He gets up in the morning, his bath robe is there waiting for him. He walks into the bathroom. The bath is drawn for him already. Even when he gets out of the bath, the towel is already folded in a special way, so he just has to sit in it and wrap it around himself. Then he goes into the dressing room. His clothes are laid out for him. Even his socks, left and right, are in the exact right spot. Charles even has valets squeeze one inch of toothpaste onto his toothbrush every morning. If anyone gets anything wrong, everyone is scolded. Gosh, and I'm sure y'all remember the viral video of him from September of 2022 forcing a servant to come clear off the desk of like three pieces of paper because he couldn't have done it himself. Since that highly debated viral clip was mentioned, I'll make the next point about how gratitude is implied. Which it's most definitely not. I don't see a lot of gratitude coming from royal families. There is endless videos and pictures of these sour-faced monarchs harassing and devaluing the endless service they have accompanying them. Let me hit y'all with an iconic example. Have you seen Downton Abbey? Most folks have. Have you ever noticed one of their royal or aristocratic characters ever say thank you to their servants. No? And that's an intentional detail, as it's been a long since unspoken, at least in British monarchy, that servants are best unthanked and unheard. Now, Alistair Bruce in the BTS documentary about the TV show series explained his perspective, that the servants did everything for their masters, and if thanks were given, it would be necessary to say them at least 60 times a day. That would be, as the English say, tiresome. It does stand that servants are not required to be thanked no matter if they just tied your shoe or wipe your 
class, you as a royal have the right to just scoff and point and expect results. But at least one royal who can't verbally berate you is the revered royal pets. Multiple royal houses and their respective rulers have decided to use these rules and servants to treat their pets as an extension of themselves. By personifying them, even just trimming a corgi's nails too short could get you proverbially beheaded and definitively fired. Some famous examples of royals who have servants service their pets are Queen Elizabeth II staged a funeral for a chameleon and an Indian ruler Muhammad Mahaba Khan threw a lavish elaborate wedding for his dog. Louis of France took being a cat person to a whole other level and basically turned Vassals into a giant breeding ground. Charles II of England issued a royal law that his iconic King Charles Spaniels, which are obviously named after him, have license to walk anywhere in the kingdom without harassment, even parliament. And of course, who can forget Caligula, who appointed his favorite horse, Icaritas, as an official senator. But I'd have to say, I imagine there's not much worse than food tasting. Normally, you'd be able to think this wouldn't be so bad. Wrong, let me make it worse. So obviously, they're tasting it for poison and other tricky little substances that could be take down a king. What if the soup was laced with arsenic? How easy is it to slip into the kitchen and lace the king's food with belladonna or hemlock? The food tester was always a servant or sometimes even a slave or a prisoner. And if you think about those status of those people, well, they were eating mush flour and bone broth and then calling it a day. Given the opportunity to be a food taster means the literal taste of luxury. The only eft part is the first bite of flavorful rice you're ever going to eat in your life, you're going to immediately die, maybe. It'd be enough for you to put off eating any meal you didn't prepare yourself, and there'd be no way of knowing if the food was deadly until you've after you've eaten it. In 1594, there was a plot to poison Queen Elizabeth, apparently the king of Spain, as the Spanish were enemies of England at the time. A group of Portuguese men had agreed to carry out the dirty work, including the queen's own physician, Rodrigo Lopez. Once the plot was uncovered, all men were executed. And it's not just our ancient royals that brought people on to do this task. Naturally, President Putin has a food taster as part of his security team. No hoovering, which is British for don't vacuum. In 2011, Royal Servants was uploaded to YouTube, a documentary that gave insight into what it's like working for the royal family, including accounts from former butlers, chefs, nannies, and footmen. To quote the narrator, the best servant is one that is neither seen nor heard. The royal family demands the most professional servants in the world, the kind of servants that would rather die than make a mistake. She continues on in this not pretentious at all breakdown saying that behind the scenes, butlers lay out clothes, footmen carry early morning trays, and cleaners sweep carpets, lest royal ears are offended by vacuum cleaners? One rule cleaners must follow is that they have to sweep the floors instead of hoovering them because the sound may be too loud, especially in the early morning. I don't know if you guys have seen these palaces, but they're about 110% red carpet, and it's not that cheap kind. This stuff probably holds holds onto dirt the way your homie holds on to their cheating ex. Not being permitted to use such modern inventions makes their job not even a little, but a lot more difficult. Immensely. They have to quite literally sweep the carpets, the most ineffective way to clean a carpet that's tacked into the ground. And they're already being held at a higher standard than really any other servant on earth. But don't forget, after you're done measuring the carrots, you feed the horses, and sweeping a carpet, you also have to kiss the linens. Whichever unfortunate servant was tacked with making Henry VIII's bed after he woke up in the morning, was then required to kiss every part of the linen to prove he hadn't smeared poison on them. What? Don't get me wrong, Henry was like intensely and increasingly paranoid. You can go check my recent video, Top 10 King Henry VIII's Facts You Never Knew, to learn more about his whole mess. But anyway, someone screws the pooch. Pretty sure it's Ambroise Parch, the 16th century French royal physician who once wrote, now poisons do not only kill, being taken into to the body, but some being put or applied outwardly. And now, this delusional hypochondriac finds out the poison can sink in through his skin, not just be ingested, and he insists on this gross ritual. In an era where sheets don't get washed, and he doesn't wash, and he's all sweaty and gouty, and banging tons of biddies in that bed. Imagine having to kiss those sheets every morning. That's the real poison. R.I.P. dude, mint essence oil under the nose, and I'm just praying for you. When the standard of hygiene is so low, your only request is that X marks the spot. Eleanor Harmon, the author of The Royal Art of Poison, says royal palaces, some courtiers don't even bother to look for a chamber pot, but just drop their britches and did their business. All of their business. All of it. All of it. In the staircases, the hallways, or the fireplaces. In Versailles, women just pulled up their skirts to pee where they stood, and some men urinated off the balustrade in the middle of the royal chapel. The smelly truth is that Hampton Court, that of Henry VIII, was 
was not well equipped to serve the bodily needs of hundreds upon hundreds of hundreds of servants. During the king's boisterous banquets, busy servants regularly needed the call of nature, so they relieved themselves in hidden hallway corridors or on sizzling fireplaces that were cooking the food. I, I need a minute with that one. Anyways, the walls reeked of urine so badly that according to historian Lucy Worsley in her book If Walls Could Talk, the palace management would have had crosses chalked into the walls with the hope that people would be reluctant to desecrate a religious symbol. That's right. While servants were always encouraged to pee in vats, oh you know, so their urine could be used to clean later, to keep servants and courtiers from urinating on the garden walls, Henry had large crosses painted in problem spots, I guess. But instead of deterring men from relieving themselves, what it did was literally give them a target. To fix the problem, Henry VIII then realized he had to make bathrooms. So he constructed a giant toilet block by the River Thames called the Great House of Easement. And of course, last but not least, fresh out the kitchen of Henry VIII is Dee's roasted chestnuts. King Henry VIII's kitchen at Hampton Court Palace was one of the largest kitchens in Europe. And obviously, it would have had to be to service the banquets of grandeur I was just talking about. Talking about. There were huge wood fireplaces producing an average of 800 to 1,000 meals in a day, courtesy of just a mere 200 cooks. Naturally, that amount of ovens and that amount of cooks in the kitchen, yeah, it's downright cozy. And the average of 1.3 million logs were burnt, creating a hellish atmosphere, leaving the cooks drained and drenched in sweat. From roasting meats to boiling cauldrons, the kitchen of Henry VIII was no less than passing as the underworld. So, what happened in all this heat, dare say? Did the crack a window. Did they get some ice? Take a smoke break, maybe. Nah, the cooks just took off all their clothes to tolerate the temperature while it's cooking. Just to reiterate, all their clothes. All of them. But alas, the atrocities were never ending for these men, as King Henry VIII issued an order to stop being naked or in garments of such vileness as they do now, nor lie in the nights and days in the kitchen or the ground by the fireside. To combat the problem, clerks of the kitchen were instructed to purchase honest and wholesome garments for the staff. And guess what? that was. There's a reason the apron covers the front. At number 10, Caligula. This guy reigned for four years, and the amount of straight up excess he demanded led him to be the first Roman emperor to be assassinated. Caligula was 25 years old when he took power in 37 AD, and he was great. He announced political reforms and recalled all exiles, but within the same year, he contracted an illness that sent him a little uh, loopy. Like to the degree of ordering hundreds of Roman merchant ships to form a two mile floating bridge across the Bay of Bowley so he could spend two days galloping back and forth across it on his horse, Incitatus. Oh, um, speaking of his horse, he loved that animal so much, giving him his own house with a marble stall and ivory manger. And he almost appointed the horse consul before Caligula met his end. It got worse in the years after his demise, like in 39 and 40 AD when he led campaigns to the Rhine and the English Channel, where he actually avoided battles and instead did things like commanding his troops to plunder the sea, which means gathering shells in their helmets. The perfectly sane kind of things that you do when your favorite quote is, remember that I have the right to do anything to anybody. Number 9, Ramses II. He literally has the most statues of himself of all the 4,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs. That is really all I gotta say, actually. Ramses II was undoubtedly the greatest pharaoh. I don't know if that justifies his spoiled ways, but it helps explain them at the very least. He was a master builder, a war hero, and brokered peace all around over his crazy long reign. But he was also really good at the whole propaganda thing. Like I said, he has statues of himself all over Egypt that even to this day are hard to avoid. Not to mention all the buildings built in his name, including a whole temple to himself and one to one of his wives, Nefertari. He moved the capital from Thebes to the new capital he created named, unsurprisingly, Pi Ramses, from which he ruled for 67 years, had literally hundreds of children and dozens of wives. He also, kind of hilariously, renovated statues and temples erected by previous pharaohs with his tag, either to pay respect or what I'm going to go with, just to say, look at this big statue of some other dude, but always remember, trademarked by Ramses the Great. P.S. I'm awesome. Number eight, Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Ah, see, I got you. I pulled a sneaky on you, but yeah, he's still a king. 
And maybe he was the biggest celebrity who ever lived. Would Halloween really be Halloween without Thriller? And how could cool guys let you know they were cool in the 80s if they didn't have all that leather jacket and stuff? You wouldn't be able to know. You just wouldn't. Well, maybe some things you don't know about Michael Jackson were his shopping habits. The man loved shopping. And with that kind of money, well, you can do anything. Well, some may remember his chimp, his Neverland Mansion complete with carnival rides and arcade, and even an oxygen chamber in case Darth Vader was coming over to stay the night. However, something very strange the man tried to do was he tried to buy a very strange man himself, or rather his bones. For some reason, Michael had a fascination with the Elephant Man, a man with severe facial deformities and freak show performer from the late 1800s. Michael tried to purchase his remains. That's it. That's the point. He tried to buy him. They wouldn't let him, but he tried. That's a weird thing to buy. I've never, when I, whenever I hit the number, I don't go, hey, 1 800 museum people, someone bring me King Tot. I want it. Number seven, Elvis Presley. Lots of similarities today. Elvis Presley, before Michael Jackson, he was probably the most famous person to ever exist. The king of rock and roll, baby, that's right. All I'll say is phone your grandma and ask her how she feels about him. She probably says she loves his music and those gyrating hips. At the time, it was pretty controversial. Boy, only if they knew what was going on today. Whew. Sorry, 50s Atomic families. Well, being that Elvis Presley was the king and the first celebrity to be idolized the way we do with modern celebrities, he became quite wealthy. Well, with all that money, he bought some weird things, including a chimp. Everyone's buying a monkey, they want a zoo, I don't know. A mansion property he named Graceland, a pink Cadillac for his mother, and strangely enough, he bought FDR's yacht. Yeah, what? That's so weird. Good president, sure, but does it really have room for a monkey in a pink Cadillac? I don't know. Number six, French royalty. This one is more about Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. It's kind of like a two-pack, kind of like a couple, but trust me, it all makes sense in the end. Uh, but it, again, and anything they bought, it was probably the king's wallet, wasn't it? Okay, so when your country is starving, demanding more rights, and in general, life really sucks, what's the next best thing you do? Buy a $12 million necklace. Yeah, right, okay, I've said that before, sure. Okay, Chad, what else? Continue to live your opulent life on the kings and people's dimes. Sure, why not? It makes sense, okay. I'm talking too much. Well, something I learned today and something that Taylor showed me is that I guess the last Queen of France was a little lonely. So what did King Louis do to fix this? Spend more time with her? Nay. Buy her a new dog? Nay, sir and madams. He had her pug from Austria imported to the country. And anyone can tell you that when something is imported, you are going to be dishing out a few more dosh. Yes, that's right. They imported her pug from Austria. Imagine how that sounds when your house is literally falling apart, you're starving, and you pay the most taxes. Makes you want to put heads on pikes. That's what it makes you want to do. Can you imagine that? We're all poor and hungry. She's like, well, look at my dog. It's my dog. They're French, they don't sound like that, but this is my dog, look at my dog, here he is. <laughs> Number five, King of Egypt. His Majesty Farouk I, by the grace of God, King of Egypt and the Sudan, that was his full title, was disposed during his nation's 1952 revolution and spent the remainder of his days in exile to Italy. In his haste to avoid getting the Mussolini treatment, he left behind a majority of his most prized possessions. When the people got a look at what he was uh, storing behind the walls of his residence, they were a bit disgusted to find an excessive number of expensive suits, rare stamps and coins, jewels, luxury vehicles and many other things that I will never afford. Now, what else would he have that would be considered strange? I'll let you take a guess. Was it A, a blam blam cache? B, piles and piles of a white substance that made the 80s fun? Or C, an unsettling amount of gardening magazines? Go ahead and let us know in the comments below. I'll give you a second. Mm -hmm. Do, 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 do. Nope, time's up. If you said secret option D, you'd be right. What was it, you ask? Well, it was a disturbing amount of adult entertainment. So much so, it wouldn't even fit underneath his mattress. Man, that's, that's a lot. That's too much. That's too much. Number four, Peter the Third. Remember the last time you played with your toys as a kid? Same. And let us know what your favorite toys were as a kid. Let's see if we have some shared favorites. I'm actually curious. That's kind of a cool thing to talk about. Well, for Peter the Third, it was little army men, or tin soldiers, I guess you'd call them. And yes, he played with them as an adult, staging mock battles. Is it the weirdest thing ever? No, it's not. But he was a king, so that's a wee bit strange. Hey, I love army men just as much as the next guy, especially those little green plastic dudes. I used to love those video games too. Very underrated in my opinion. I love that stuff. It also makes me think of that scene in Spaceballs. 
Enough references aside, you never really know someone until you've seen the money they've spent on their army men collection. Number three, Ibrahim the first. Fur, fur everywhere. Abram I of the Ottoman Empire was the 18th Sultan and the number one purchaser of fine furs. Personally, I've never had any fine furs. I grew up in the trailer park and Mama always said that fur was cruel anyway, so I never felt the luxury of uh, fine furs, if you will. It must be nice because Ibram loved them so much. Like, he really, really loved them. His whole wardrobe consisted of them, in fact. Plus, his walls were covered in them, and apparently even his curtains. I don't do well in heat, so I'll pass on that. I'd be sweating way too much. Too much fur. Number two, the locksmith. Who are you and how'd you get in here? I'm the locksmith, and uh, I'm the locksmith. Classic Leslie Nielsen. God, I love that guy. I love those movies. I'd love to make one one day. We're starring one. Hollywood, call me. King Louis XVI, the last king of France. We're back to him again. The man spent his time and money on something rather strange. No, not all was spent on his wife and her life. And yeah, I'm kind of putting him on the list twice, but trust me, it's weird. I mean, come on, he gave the queen whatever the heck she wanted. Well, apparently he loved to spend his time and money on locksmithing. What? Yeah, that's so weird. He would spend his time trying to get into locks and understand them. He was also stated as saying that every man should have a passion. Hey, maybe put down the locks and start helping the people as a passion. There's an idea. What a great idea. Feed the people. Instead, I'm just going to work on this lock. I'm just going to go ahead and just, yeah, almost got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Number one, Christian the Seventh of Denmark. I saw this and I just, I just had to put it on here. I mean, come on. Apparently, the guy wasn't very mentally stable. I mean, who is these days? Apparently, the royal spent a lot of his time uh, waxing his carrot, polishing the flagpole, tenderizing the gabagoo, charming the snake, uh, self-firing in all cylinders, the one-handed bedroom dance. Uh, what I did all summer long in high school. You get the point, okay? You understand what I'm trying to say. Truth of the matter is, you don't get there with a little help from Vaseline or St. Ives. The man bought time so he could be this way. The man is either a legend or a crazy person. Imagine having that much money and that much time in your day that that's all you do. Number 10, King Midas. Most people know the story of King Midas, but in a nutshell, he was a king who was granted the power of the everything he touched turned to solid gold. So, no, he didn't exactly buy anything with that kind of power, but the man can have anything he wants or buy anything he wants. It's a lot of gold. This sounds great, but it's really awful for a couple of reasons. One, that is pretty much the moral of the story, and the other is, well, some basic uh, economy stuff. The first reason this would suck is that, one, you should never be too greedy, and you really shouldn't. And you should always be careful what you wish for. This blessing quickly turned into a curse as Midas could no longer eat. Which, uh, that's bad. Not eating and everything you touch turned to gold. Ugh, you couldn't hug anybody. It's terrible. The other issue would be his wealth. You'd have to be very careful on how many items you actually touched, as producing too much gold would eventually devalue the price of gold. Especially if you touch a bed or something, that, that's, that's a lot of gold. Imagine how much a solid gold bed would weigh, or how much that would be worth. So in reality, you would be both starving and poor. Number 9, Mansa Musa. Sort of related to the King Midas issue, Mansa Musa was probably the richest man to ever walk the face of the earth. A king from northern Africa who exploited his country's salt and gold reserves. His estimated wealth today would be around the $400 billion mark. $100 billion US, ooh, that's a lot of money. Tough to actually measure it exactly because it was from so long ago, but it could be less, and some say it could actually even be more. Mansa Musa went on tour one year to see all the beautiful things he could of the ancient world, and you can't take a little vacation without buying something at the gift shop. Mansa Musa was so rich and spent so much money in a few towns that he visited that he single-handedly upset the economy of those cities. Elon Musk wishes he could. So he basically bought a lot of stuff, and it was unusual because it upset the economy. Like, he destroyed the economy of those downs. That's insane. Next up is a literal Disney castle. What Ludwig II really loved was castles. Sure, he already had a bunch, but he wanted more, and he wanted them to look like they just came out of fairy tale pop-up books. So much so, he didn't actually hire real architects. On more than one occasion, castles were literally designed by an opera set designer, ripping Ludwig off for being such a nitwit fanboy. One was supposed to be a replica of Versailles, another was a weird combination of styles, and one was set up atop a mountain. New Swanstein. Ludwig's most expensive project 
that's drained the Bavarian government's banks into the negatives. This castle is unbelievable though. Ludwig probably would have been thrilled to learn his fairy tale goal was achieved, as the castle became the basis for Sleeping Beauty's castle in the Disneyland parks and the inspiration for the castle in Disney's 1950s Cinderella movie. However, foreign banks threatened to seize this property in 1885, but he refused. In retaliation, the government doctored medical documents that would declare him insane and forced his removal from the throne. The private king was then found dead just weeks after moving into said new castle in 1886, floating inexplicably in the lake. Homeboy is barely cold and in the ground before the government starts trying to make a profit off of the debt incurring castle. Seven weeks following Ludwig's mysterious death, New Schwanzenstein is open to the public and remains one of the most visited castles in Germany and one of the most popular tourist and luxury hotel destinations in Europe. This next king's anthem must have been Avril Lavigne's here's to never growing up. King Farouk, the last king of Egypt, was so immature his mother hoped that becoming king would help him grow up. Obviously it didn't, cause country rule and wealth aren't something you give immature people if you want them to change. It just gives the dude arrested development and a whole lot of power. His reign was dominated by corruption scandals, his people were impoverished, and his court was brimming with wealth. So the Egyptian army eventually intervened, driving him out in 1952. Then the process of clearing out his possessions began. Thousands of silk shirts, an entire fleet of Cadillacs, 50 diamond studded golden walking sticks, Farouk collected an absurd amount of French Baroque style furniture and his coin collection was one of the grandest in the world, consisting of over 8,500 coins, some of which, like the 1993 $20 gold double eagle and all five known examples of the 1913 Liberty head nickel would be worth millions today and they were then too. He once decided he wasn't a fan of the railway station used twice a year and had the old one demolished and built a new one for millions of dollars. And what was most shocking to people at the time was his extensive adult entertainment collection. At the time, the largest adult entertainment collection in the world, worth over a million dollars. Picture like when Russell Peters was on MTV Cribs and he opened that dresser drawer and inside all the DVDs had to be pixelated. It was essentially that moment except Russell Peters actively volunteered and made fun of his collection while Froke when confronted with it, happily admitted to owning it but was shocked by the lewd accusations, insisting they're just classical works of art to look at and be appreciated. This next king didn't have to buy anything, he turned the money itself into big old jars. Who? Name brace moment, okay. Maharaja Sawai Madho Singh II is the former king of Japur and also the only one who's been entered into the Guinness Book of World Records. He was on his way to attend the coronation of Edward VII in 1902 and intended to bring Ganjagal holy water. When toying in what to bring it in, all the options on the market were very Macy's and Singh, he was more of a Gucci guy. So he finds two very reputable silversmiths in the mystery Kana and gave them 14,000 Japur silver rupees which were issued from the Kaptadara treasury of Japur state in 1894. These coins are then melted into sheets and shaped as the jars, no shouldering was done. So the results are two enormous sterling silver vessels, the largest silver silver objects in the world, per Guinness World Records. These Ganjalis are still presented at the Maharaja Sawai Man Singh II Museum and are a huge attraction amongst visitors. Next up is a title that needs no explanation, the Pew Procurer. Yeah, there's always that one creep. This is this one also happens to be voted England's worst king by a large chunk of the historian community. It says a lot seeing as his dad was the nutcase who lost America, but maybe we're just throwing stones here. If you haven't guessed already, I'm talking about George IV, notorious for two things, banging and blowing the budget. Which started to go hand in hand after a while on a very short list of decent things you can say about the dude. It's actually unlikely he ever forced himself on someone without consent, which don't get me wrong, I'm not patting him on the back, that's setting the bar pretty low. But I mean, when a woman refused his advances, the series of events following would be the first five stages of grief, then begging, then a tantrum, potentially more begging. So sometimes threatening to take his own life in a very dramatic fashion, and then if nothing's worked, offer up money and jewels. Didn't matter if you're a working girl or a potential princess, he's willing to pay up the dough for 
you know, amazingly, despite not being a catch in any way and inflating to the size of the aunt in Harry Potter who floats away, women still agreed to have sweaty time with him, and they say money can't buy happiness. Sure did for Georgie. And P.S. When he died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair in it, which wasn't always from his mistress's head, if you know what I mean. Because I love my subtle hints, or even not so subtle, our next is I'm a big fan. Frederick William the First, King of Prussia, a tiny man with a big collection. Tall dudes. Maybe he was trying to make up for the fact he was only 5'5", five five, but being 5'2 myself, I can't really see the appeal of walking around next to a flock of people I have to crane my head to look at constantly. So, whatever the reason, he would do absolutely anything to get more tall men. Such as buy tall young men from their own custody. Just walk up to everyday dudes on the street, I wanna buy you. Apparently he even kidnapped some. Other countries would try and get in his good books by sending tall guys as presents. Babies that came out larger than normal are marked with a red scarf to indicate their future recruits. There weren't enough tall babies? Let's round up the basketball and volleyball players and hop to it guys. Frederick William literally performed formed a kind of eugenics, pouring money into making tall people bang in the hopes of producing a tall kid. He didn't like them just to look up at though. He was creating his own special army regiment known as the Potsdam Giants. The only requirement to be in this group is he had to be over six foot, but most of the cases the men were taller than that. Being huge had its advantages because the taller you were, the more you got paid. So what was the point of this very expensive, fashionable armed regiment? Not to go to war, just to cheer up the king. He poured thousands into these men and treated them like they're his favorite toys. He would have them paraded in front of him, sometimes in his own bedroom when he was sick in bed. Next up is the Lick It and Stick It King. So, the Queen and Prince William are said to be passionate bingo players, and Her Royal Highness used to enjoy drama novels, horse racing, and at her Scottish residence she'd host Scottish dances. Her grandfather George though, his main hobby was stamp collecting. Starting as a young prince, he continued his collection into the time as a monarch, even through the chaos of World War I. What's unusual about George's hobby was how many stamps he collected over his lifetime. 328 albums of 60 pages each, so that's nearly 20,000 pages of stamps. His passion earned him the nickname the King of Filati, which is the proper name for stamp collecting and I can't tell if I'm saying it right, as literally nobody would know because this may truly be one of the most vacant brained hobbies imaginable. Anyways, George becomes like a celebrity to other stamp collectors and he's elected the vice president of their Royal Society of London Stamp Collecting Club in 1893. So in 1905, while he's still a prince, he set the new record for the most most amount spent on a stamp. Roughly 220,000 US dollars today. A courtier later, knowing the prince was an active part of the stamp community, asked if he'd heard that some damned fool had paid as much as over 1,400 pounds for one stamp. The prince got that sick moment of getting to turn around and say, yes, I was that damned fool. This one king bought so much dumb crap, it's essentially a grocery list of the obscene. So Henry VIII, the one who smokes his wives and was full of aggression. We recently did a video on him called the Top 10 King Henry VIII Facts You Never Knew. So if you're interested in learning more after what I tell you about what he hoarded, maybe go check that out. So what are some of the things on Henry's stupid purchase list? Purple bagpipes. Although he didn't write green sleeves, Henry was nevertheless a talented musician and composer and was able to spend a few thousand pounds on that bad boy. A personal favorite that I learned was probably the bowling alley. Built after the birth of his son Edward in 1537, this massive expenditure was almost 200 feet long and it was more than three times the length of a modern 10 pin bowling alley. Records show in 1526, Henry commissioned a pair of leather football boots that cost four shillings. Nowadays, that's a couple thousand. Hilariously, 14 years later in 1540, he banned football. You know what you should spend taxpayer dollars on? A cod piece so big you can hide a weapon in it. Henry is credited with popularizing the peculiar Tudor fashion for the enormous exaggerated cod pieces, which during his reign established themselves as symbols of a man's virility and masculinity. The king, of course, had to have the biggest cod piece of all, and towards the end of his life, Henry's cod pieces became so roomy, he could literally have glorified pockets and keep jewels and other valuables and even small weapons in there. Last but not least is two kings and a rager. In 1509, Henry VIII, England's most famous monarchs, ascended to the throne, ensuring the Tudor succession after his father. After almost a decade of rule, the young king agreed to follow the advice of close advisor Cardinal Wolsey and try to improve England's relations with the 
continent. After Wolseley's efforts in 1518, the Treaty of London was signed as a non-aggression pact between the major Christian, very important detail, European powers at the time. One of the most important countries for England to make peace with was France, as the two had been beefing intermittently for literal centuries. The French king, Francis I, was only three years younger than Henry, and both men had been hailed in their countries as great renaissance princes. Naturally, these two dudes are going to be curious about what each other's like, and they want to meet. And for two dudes who are young and rich, what better way to meet than throw in a rager? A date is set for June of 1520, and what would follow is probably one of the greatest, greatest parties ever held. The meeting was an excuse for both Henry and Francis to show off their wealth of their kingdoms, and by proxy, their power. So the field of the cloth of gold occurred on the 7th to 24th of June, 1520, named after the gold material used for all the tents, all the costumes, and the decorations at the time. And it was two weeks of games, feasts, tournaments, and balls that cost the equivalent of no less than $20 million today between France and England. Between the 7th and the 24th, around 12,000 members of royal houses, nobles, guests, and servants gathered in the fields of northern France to spend dreamy days and nights in temporary palaces built of brick, timber, cloth, and glass. Guests enjoyed delicacies made from 29,000 fish, 98,000 eggs, 6,475 birds, 2,200 sheep, and endless glasses of wine. Whilst the celebrations were a success, in reality it did actually little to improve the relationship between England and France, and within a few years the countries were at war once again. Yeah.